to be honest, I was, um, I just, first of all, I want to thank everyone for two days of intensely rich discussions and particularly to Bill and James for inviting me and um, I have got copious notes, <laughs> um, largely because this is an area that is, um, yeah, I'd say it's, 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 it's relative, it's not new to me and I know it's, I know that uh, this, this work exists, but it's not one that I've actually sat and had to think about and others have said this, but it's not, I'm including myself, but I've actually had to sit and think about the, the, um, the practical, and the, uh, that's why I love this title of this workshop, the practical politics of what global integration would look like, and to hear from all of you about the way in which you've grappled with and engaged with it, and have to think about really complex um, from ideas from surveys um, through to um, the implications of trying to manage and think about engagement with 190 odd different states with different populations and, and, and building on something that, as, we, as the group was saying yesterday, has, has a relatively short history in terms of the lifespan of modern states, but on the other hand has actually quite a long history in terms of when we're thinking about the, the moral purpose and why we'd want to pursue a moral government or, or, a, moral, or a world government or a world state. I'm going to limit my, my comments largely to what has been talked about today and I went back to the, to, the, to the abstract for the workshop and noted that there was sort of two aims that I identify here. The first was to talk about the challenges that stand in the way of superstate integration and the means by which we can pursue it. And I hope it's okay if I've done this, but I've kind of divided the talks into who I felt was identifying the challenges and who I felt was identifying the means. And then I've got some, I suppose, questions, or I've taken other people's questions and I'm presenting them as my own um, to, 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 sort of, to sort of conclude. Um, so I'm talking about the challenges. I, for me, what, what's happened, and I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but to me, the, the presentations today individuals in each panel quite neatly took, one took challenges and one took means. So this morning I felt Shirley was talking very clearly about the challenges that are currently before international law and treaties and the idea of, of, of if you like, relating their, their moral function, the, pu the purpose and the power that they potentially have against those practical limitations of who can decide and who is able to decide whether or not they wish to implement them and at what moments they wish to not be guided by them or not. And then so it was interesting on the flip side to then have Joel talking about the means and what he was identifying to him was, was capturing these moments of international law reciprocity in his words. And for me, the, the catch in his presentation or perhaps in advance is when then he talked about what, that I've perhaps identified the low hanging fruit. So he talks about that a lot of what I've looked at has been low politics. But then, and, I, and I'm jumping ahead here, but to me what was very important about his example was, was tax-based evasion, tax evasion and profit sharing and how he brought that into what he saw as low-hanging fruit. And as I said, I'm jumping ahead here, but when we come down onto the next panel and when we heard Lou's talk and then the James talk, we heard actually that this idea that you can so easily separate those low politics areas from those high politic areas doesn't actually, um, it's a lot more complicated than that actually and you can have some very some really important moments of capture of where you think about the way in which these what appear to be these sort of narrow pursuits of cooperation particularly in the area of the economic realm can actually expand and broaden and get us talking and thinking about interdependence across economic security and human rights in particular and this then leads to my next point about what i thought in the next talk we had lou again I think you know this beautiful rubric of, of world stateness and where the, 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 the articulating, if you like, a moral vision about the question of what it is that we want to conceptualize and how do we want to realize the world state and presenting these four different visions, if you like, of, of where, it, where we can start to pursue this question. And then James talking about the fact that actually we're seeing it happen in practice already, particularly at that regional level where we're seeing states. And I would actually argue to some extent Perhaps in a bit of a challenge to Mark, um, <laughs> that I would argue that for me, I identified a lot with what I have seen with the development of the ASEAN Charter and, in particular, the ASEAN, um, the AIH, DHR, so the Commission on Human Rights. So you're seeing, I think, actually, to me, what's really quite interesting is when you're seeing regional organisations, in particular, dealing and grappling and thinking about this, these relationships, these complex relationships between their economic integration, how it's feeding and building on their security and 
integration. And then you're seeing, particularly, for example, in ASEAN, you're seeing these um, parliamentary representations then arguing for these human rights inclusions in these regional agreement arrangements as well. And again, they may be rhetoric at first, but then they start, you see them incrementally start to have power. And so, you know, the ASEAN Human Rights Parliamentarian Group met and articulated opposition uh, to, to Obama's visit to Vietnam recently, and that was seen as quite an important move in terms of that voice being heard and being quite strong. And it was particularly also in the case of the rights of Rohingya in Myanmar, we've also seen the ASEAN Human Rights Parliament take on quite strong rhetoric here or lines about the responsibility of the Myanmar state here. So that's sort of my snapshot, if you like, of how I see everyone sort of today has talked about the means and both the challenges and both the means sort of, if you like, in response. Um, I want to now turn to, if you like, sort of the, what I would say are the two outstanding problems or, or questions that I'm still trying to grapple with. Um, the first one is borrowing lose, which is what is world state for? And why are we talking about world state and world government? What is it for? What is its purpose? Um, and in particular, I think even though there's been there's an argument and there's been a repeated argument that we need to, if you like, think about the function before we turn to the form, that there's no bright line. I love that what you put on. There's no bright line between the government and the state. For me, what I kept bump coming bumping up against is that I felt there was. Actually, I thought that there is a need to really actually ask, what are we constructing? There was this presumption that if we think about the moral purpose of it first, we're then able to engage with and then talk about what form that should take. But then on the other hand, what I kept coming up against is then who gets to be represented in articulating what that moral purpose is. And then that leads to my next question. So for me, it's, um, what is the world state for? But then I also was thinking, well, who is, is the world state for? And that's where then I think we have to then, at some point, it, it, it's like two tracks that have to, in my opinion, they have to be actually happening at the same time. It has to be, because again, it comes back to Joe's question about, well, where is the, where is the population movement here? Where is their engagement in these processes in particular? And some of the processes that we've heard about today, like international law and reciprocity, um, the, these sort of regional organisations, these regional movements. I was thinking too, like, how do we think about places and locations for local NGOs? So not the NGOs that are able to identify, group, and, and locate themselves in New York or Geneva at those relevant meetings, but how do we think about and include and identify those local NGOs, women's movements, women's groups, who we know are overwhelmingly unrepresented in a lot of these organisations, these meetings? How do we think about the inclusions of refugees in, min in minority groups, to uh, stateless groups, you know, 53 million refugees. What, how do we think about their voices being represented in whatever type of world government or world state we want to develop? And that straight away does, in my opinion, bring us back to having to then think about um, form. And so for me, actually thinking more about world state, world government, and how do we, whatever we move forward on, how do we ensure that those groups are included and part of the discussion is also then inevitably related back to, to the moral purpose of this discussion, which for me, from what I hear, is representation. And so for me, the thing that I keep coming back to in all of these discussions is who, are we represent, who wants to be represented in these talks and how do we include and ensure their representation under the current structures that we've got.